comments fairly quickly. Um, and if you have any questions, please you could feel free to stop me as I go along and ask questions um, if I'm going too quickly. And um, Mitra, do I have to have you advance my slides? Um, I, I, if you prefer that, I can certainly do that. Just say next slide or I can give you remote control access. Okay, just go ahead and give me access. That might be a little easier. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, let me know if that uh, allows you to proceed to the next slide. Okay, let me see here if I can. Should I go to speaker view? Is that how I do it? No. How would I get to advance them? If you hit the, the arrow on your keyboard, uh, the right arrow, it should allow you to advance the slides. Yeah, see, it's not. Oh, there it is. Sure. All right. Very good. Thank you. Now I went too fast. I was getting impatient here. Okay. Very good. Let me go back then to the beginning. Um, so this um, is a case study based on um, a gentleman who came into our um, hospital and he came for a second opinion. Um, he was referred from an outside hospital for a cabbage a mitral valve repair and he wanted a second opinion because we do the minimally invasive mitral valve surgery um, here at our healthcare um, center, our hospital. And so his blood pressure really was his limiting factor in regards to his heart failure management. He reported dizziness on his um, co-reg. And so at the time of this uh, visit for his second opinion, uh, the dose was reduced um, from 6.25 down to 3.125. It seems to be, I don't know, very hesitant as I'm um, trying to use my arrow here. Oh, see, it's just very slow. And so then I'm going too fast, okay. There we go. All right, so here's a little bit about his medical history. He has congestive heart failure. Um, he did have a blood transfusion in the past. He's had a history of a um, MI, um, valvular disease, high cholesterol and hypertension. Um, these are his current medications. As you can see, he's got some BPH and is on that Flomax. The rest are uh, cardiovascular um, cholesterol medications. And his past surgical history included um, an angioplasty, hemorrhoidectomy, and tonsillectomy. He is married. He has a history of um, never having smoked. Um, he did use smokeless tobacco, but he quit 20 years ago, and he reports no alcohol use. These were his vital signs at his first visit. Um, for this second opinion, everything looks to be um, in the normal range. And this was his physical exam, no um, jugular vein distension. Um, he did have an irregular heart rate and a, a um, holosystolic murmur. Um, and uh, so, at this visit for the second opinion, his diagnosis and plan um, included these diagnoses um, and um, he was given at the time congestive heart failure, New York Heart Association class three. Um, he did have tricuspid valve insufficiency and poor dentition. So these were the orders that were placed. They did the five meter walk test, um, a cardiac catheterization for right and left um, heart catheterization. And then um, we're going to uh, continue his co-reg at the lower dose. And so um, this was his uh, discharge um, summary. He was actually approached um, about the uh, Tendine uh, study, and there's a 60-day waiting period for that study um, after his um, uh, cardiac catheterization and um, his Plavix therapy in order to be eligible for that study. So um, 
after that second opinion, um, he actually had a readmission 25 days days after that and he was admitted with um, hematuria, gross hematuria and shortness of breath. So he was admitted and um, he was found to have a uh, exacerbation of his heart failure and he was diuresed with good response on Lasix, um, started on lisinopril and aldactone um, and uh, if you know they wanted to observe him to see if that was tolerated well. Um, his hematuria, they obtained a UA and um, it showed that he did have a um, Staphylococcus aureus UTI, which was treated with NSF um, and was then transitioned to um, Augmentin upon discharge. He was um, referred to urology for a uh, outpatient cystoscopy and he was to follow up in our heart failure clinic three to seven days post discharge and um, had labs ordered for a BMP and a BNP. So then this poor gentleman, six days after his discharge from the hospital, he was readmitted with cellulitis. He presented to the emergency department um, with right-sided wrist pain um, and his troponin was 61. Um, and this had actually decreased from his baseline, um, but his BMP was in the mid 800s. And of course this was consistent with his baseline status and there was no evidence of volume overload. Um, and so his, he did was found to have right wrist um, cellulitis. Uh, they did not think that it was, um, septic uh, to the joint at that time. And um, so they didn't do a needle aspiration. They gave him clindamycin in the emergency department and he was discharged with a prescription for clindamycin um, with a recheck in 48 hours. So then he went to his urology consult um, for that gross uh, hematuria and um, hospital admission. They did found that he had urinary retention, bladder diverticulum um, based on the renal ultrasound and that he had multiple by um, uh, bilateral renal cyst. And so they did a um, bladder wash cytology, which was malignant for negative for malignant cells. Um, so two uh, and a half weeks after this, he did undergo his right heart catheterization for assessment of um, his uh, hemodynamics. And uh, the procedure was done without complications. He was discharged to home in stable medical condition and um, with a follow-up point up appointment in the outpatient clinic. And this was, um, these were the notes from his outpatient visit. Um, so he had no complaints upon uh, the outpatient visit. He uh, was accompanied by his wife and he was um, instructed to perform the um, inter Mitten self catheterizations um, three times a day after his cystoscopy. And so at this outpatient visit, he said that he was really only performing those catheterizations once a day. And so he um, was again uh, educated and counseled as to the need to do, to, um, do the catheterization three times a day to make sure that he was fully emptying his bladder and he verbalized understanding of those instructions. Um, so the follow-up in the heart failure clinic found that he was anemic and um, that at, at this, at the time of this uh, follow-up in the clinic, they uh, favored uh, conservative medical therapy uh, as opposed to advanced therapies and um, the optimization of his um, medical therapy uh, was actually limited by his symptomatic hypotension. He was getting dizzy and lightheaded um, upon exertion. So, um, they also 
also uh, noted that the patient did not want to pursue an LVAD workup which uh, it had been explained to him that he could be a candidate for. And um, at the time of this follow-up, he really did appear to be relatively well compensated um, from a heart failure standpoint. And um, so they didn't make any changes to his blood work uh, or to his medications, excuse me. And he was at, um, ordered lab work uh, as uh, a follow-up. And um, they talk to him about the titration of his medications along with the possibility of home inotropic therapy down the road in the event that the patient um, would require um, inotropic therapy. So um, they also talked about a possible mitral valve clip um, because of his severe mitral valve regurgitation. Um, and the patient actually uh, reported that he had improvements in his heart failure symptoms. Uh, he had been uh, treated with prednisone for his gout and um, his wrist cellulitis and had re reported improvement um, in that as well. And he denied any uh, other new or worsening cardiac symptoms um, such as short of breath, uh, chest pain, palpitations, lightheadedness, um, or paroxysmal um, nocturnal dyspnea, um, and all those sorts of things. He also denied any weight change since his last visit. So this was just his um, assessment of that visit. And you can see uh, here, New York Heart Association Functional Class 2, um, that was must have been an error in the charting because he actually was a New York Heart Association um, Class 3 at this time. So then a few weeks later, we get this email and telephone communication from the patient's wife stating that if my husband is as critically ill as you say, then you need to tell him what his options are so that he can make a decision about whether he wants it or not. This dragging things out for weeks between appointments is no good. So of course she did get a follow-up call. Um, and so um, at his next cardiology visit, um, it was found that he was non-compliant with his uh, dietary restrictions that resulted in his shortness of breath and orth orthopenia. Um, they talked about possibly starting Lasix on a daily basis. If that shortness of breath um, continues, the patient was instructed to notify the cardiology clinic when the shortness of breath occurred and to possibly increase these visits um, to avoid hospitalization down the road. And that if the patient was not interested in advanced therapies, which he already had um, you know, said he wasn't interested in the LVAD, certainly, um, or the valvular surgery at this time, then, you know, that's what needed to be done was um, more frequent uh, visit clinic, uh, clinic visits. So he was scheduled to return in three months if he had no new problems, but sooner if necessary. So then um, a week or so later, the wife calls the clinic to notify um, them that her husband's blood pressure was 77 over 50 and so he was not given his evening dose of his lisinopril. In the morning his blood pressure had improved slightly to 94 over 52 and um, he continued to have these hypotensive medications so um, he was instructed to stop taking the lisinopril altogether, the Lasix and the Spironolactone. Um, the patient felt as if he was having a buildup of fluid, he was having the difficulty breathing. Um, however, he was not weighing himself daily. He was taking these blood pressures and these were um, the latest blood pressures that he gave them at the clinic. So this, um, when I started doing the uh, chart review, you can see um, that, you know, a little bit of the problem was um, 
possibly on the patient's side because in a five-month period of time, uh, he had four canceled appointments and the reasons for those cancellations were inconvenient times, conflict in schedule, too ill to come in. Um, he did have um, Televox, which are the telephone communications um, that uh, they make to him. Uh, regarding these uh, appointments and any instructions that were given from the um, clinic uh, medical staff. So then um, this was nine o'clock in the morning um, on the day, I believe, of the admission to the hospital. The uh, patient's wife called saying that her husband was having difficulty breathing, um, very short of breath with minimal exertion, filling up with fluid. Um, these were his uh, vital signs. His O2 sats with activity would dip down into the low 80s. He was having leg pain, fatigue. He hadn't slept in three days. And so the cardiologist instructed him to report to the emergency room for evaluation, which he did. So he was found to be um, in acute um, heart failure exacerbation. Um, they did an ultrasound of his right upper quadrant um, and a uh, chest x-ray was ordered. He was uh, sent from the emergency department to uh, the observation unit and then finally um, I believe was admitted. So anyway, this was his assessment of that hospital visit. And then the um, plan was to uh, restart the aldactone um, 12.5 once daily, repeat labs in two weeks, continue all the other medications unchanged. He was in educated to weigh himself each morning and how important this was um, to, you know, track if he was going into um, another uh, exacerbation or not. And it was instructed to call the office if he had a weight gain of greater than three to four pounds over a one to two day period. And then um, the uh, call about the lab results. The um, patient's wife was called by the cardiologist staff about the lab, lab results saying that they were satisfactory, no action was needed. Um, and the wife uh, then told uh, the staff person that the patient had just gone to his PCP and had been started on antibiotics for pneumonia. So, so this poor gentleman really, you know, just was getting hit with one thing after another in terms of his health. Um, so this was his next cardiology clinic visit, which I believe was um, three months or th three weeks down the road after his uh, last visit. And um, you can read the the note there that really he was doing fairly well from a cardiovascular perspective. And the patient actually stated that he was able to walk five to six miles a few times per week without any significant symptoms, which um, was really quite remarkable based on his history. And again, um, you know, he really was class three. I th I'm afraid that these were copy and pasted possibly from old notes, not sure exactly. But um, again, they were going to check labs and see him back in the office in three months. So um, this was the follow-up from his uh, urology clinic visit. Um, and um, again, the, the patient was really only um, catheterizing himself once a day because he said that he was voiding spontaneously during the daytime, but they still wanted him to um, self-catheterize three times a day. Finally, just a few short weeks later, this was this patient's last hospitalization. He was progressively getting worse with shortness of breath over the last couple months, unable to do any activity over the past week without getting short of breath. And, you know, his O2 sat dipping down into the low 80s. Again, he was on four liters of oxygen. And um, when he uh, was on the oxygen, he his O2 sats increased to the 90s. 
disease, but he really did have significant orthopenia and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and a chronic cough. Um, his TTE revealed severe pulmonary hypertension. And um, so these were his assessments of his symptoms. Um, he did have dyspnea at rest and, um, you know, was using pillows to prop himself up at night. And um, so uh, did say that he had had an episode of chest pain a week ago. Um, and so these were his medications prior to this last hospitalization. You can look at them. Um, and um, then this was his assessment. You can see that he did have notable uh, jugular vein distension with Valsalva, um, and he was uh, jaundiced at the time of this last hospitalization. These are his labs. You can see his potassium is elevated, his BUN creatinine are elevated, um, and he uh, had chronic uh, kidney failure as well with that low uh, GFR. And these are his blood gases, which um, were also um, abnormal. And um, some more labs, he also was anemic. And um, you can see his belly, Billy Rubin, total and direct are elevated. And um, he did a couple other, hep C, which was negative. Um, and so this was just, uh, these are lab results, a comparison over time. And so you can see from when um, this patient first came in, in December of 2018 for his second opinion, um, how his lab results changed from December in six months to um, May. Uh, which I believe, you know, a six month period was his last hospitalization. So um, the assessment and plan here, as you can see, um, acute systolic uh, congestive heart failure, um, stage C, and at this point he was New York Heart Association functional class four, and uh, acute kidney injury, um, chronic kidney disease, stage three, and um, chronic jaundice. You can see the lab results there of his uh, bilirubin and um, his hyperkalemia and his chronic conditions there. So, um, the recommendations for this hospital stay, they discontinued the Lasix um, and they um, then were monitoring his renal function, um, the echocardiogram to evaluate um, his RV function, TR and on MR severity. They discussed with our structural team about the possibility to be uh, the um, mitroclip candidate, which is the uh, tendine study that we had going on at the time. And then they wanted to check for Gilbert's uh, syndrome in regards to his uh, jaundice. And then um, the pulmonary function evaluation for underlying, oops, sorry, went too fast, <laughs> for his underlying, um, now where was I? I really went too fast. I, what was I doing there? Goodness. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself here. I, I don't know why that happened. I apologize. <laughs> Okay, sorry, the pulmonary function test for uh, underlying lung disease. Here we go. And they were going to do an oxygen challenge test. So again, he was found to have a, a UTI with Enterobacter um, uh, sensitivity, and we were awaiting the sensitivities. They wanted to do the Bactrim, but in light of his elevated creatinine and his kidney disease, they uh, chose uh, Cefepime. And so then they 
did a uh, goals of care clarification and had a hospice discussion um, with the patient while he was uh, in the hospital and, you know, was just becoming very dysmic and um, unable to complete his tasks, such as mowing the lawn. So they thought it was a time to have this goals of care clarification talk and the patient did state that his, uh, he had been told that his heart was too weak for any surgical procedures and um, debutamine was started. Um, so the inotropics were started and um, the hospice resources were explained to the patient at the time. And this really surprised him because he stated to the um, hospice person that um, isn't that for someone when they're dying. And um, so he was provided with additional information about hospice and the home health services that he was eligible for. Unfortunately, when he was approached, I guess the wife had gone home um, to uh, get some rest. And um, so she wasn't there when they came in. The patient voiced um, concerns that uh, he was feeling very overwhelmed currently and he wanted time to rest and think about it. And so this, of course, was discussed with the primary team. Um, they recommended the, that the primary team review the prognosis with the patient and the wife to help facilitate you know, further goals of the conversation and they were contacting them to set up a meeting with uh, the patient and his wife um, the following uh, day or two. So finally, after this discussion occurred, um, the patient did decide to go home with hospice care, and the plan for hospice was to uh, be sent home with the uh, debutamine Debutamine and amiodarone, and um, the palliative care assistance was greatly appreciated. They um, started out of van because he was very anxious um, and um, started uh, torsamide as well um, for his. Uh, fluid buildup, and then also the oxycodone at five milligrams Q3 hours as needed. And so uh, the patient was really very glad to be going home with hospice care. Um, once he had made that decision, he seemed to be more at peace with things. And, um, you know, he had a, a the final conversation with the cardiothoracic um, team and he said that he understood that you know they did offer the open heart surgery and the LVAD but he said no I am done with all that I don't want any more surgeries and he stated that he was happy to go home with hospice so uh, they recommended um, that he be discharged with hospice and um, along with the debut mean drip as I uh, talked about. They did have him complete the post form and that was placed on the chart. Um, it stated he wanted no CPR, comfort measures only, no IV fluids except for a trial of three days um, at a maximum and no tube feeds. So, um, you know, he did have the dyspnea and was anxious. And so, you know, the, he had the appropriate meds um, in the Ativan and the oxycodone that um, he could take for that and uh, the supportive care as well. And that, so the post form again was um, faxed to the E directive registry um, so that it could be um, accessed by any of his future healthcare um, providers from that uh, state uh, and national registry. I believe. And so then these were the final orders um, that I've already covered. Um, and this was just his GI consult while he um, was in the hospital. So the patient was going to be on the Tendine trial, um, but he was told that his heart was too weak. So, of course, he did not um, uh, enter into that study. And so he was transported home with hospice care and the debutamine. 
And so now I just, um, how am I doing on time? Am I okay? Okay, good. All right, so um, this is the a, a definition of palliative care that I was actually given by our um, palliative care uh, physician who works here in the Heart and Vascular Institute, um, Dr. Charles Mwambe. And this is one that he really likes, and, and I agree with him, that it really is an interdisciplinary approach that improves the quality of lives of patients with serious illness, as well as for their families through prevention and relief of suffering. Um, and that the palliative care includes assessment and treatment of the physical symptoms, identification and relief of spiritual distress, expert communication to establish goals of care, and assistance with complex decision-making and coordination of care among the different healthcare specialties. And I think that in light of this case study, and many other instances where this happens when patients are, you know, number one, come, they come to you for a second opinion. So they've already kind of been through, um, you know, the healthcare system, a, a different healthcare system and many other tests. And then of course, you know, we oftentimes want to run updated tests and get our own, um, uh, physicians and um, care providers involved in the decision making that uh, as much as we try to work in, in interdisciplinary teams, and I think we do quite a good job here um, at West Virginia University, uh, there are still times when the patient seems to not get it. And, and um, whether it is an overload of information, which often happens um, because they are just being bombarded. I mean, if you look at this case study, this gentleman was seen by multiple um, cardiologists, the cardiothoracic um, surgery team. Um, he had GI consults. He had the pulmonary consults. He had the urology consults. And so, and he was going to his own primary care physician who wasn't involved in this healthcare. Uh, it wasn't a member of, of our healthcare system here where he was treated towards the end with pneumonia. And so, um, you know, it's just so important that we all are working together for the sake of our patients um, so that they have a clear understanding of what they're facing and um, to make an educated decision about what is best for them personally. So I think this palliative care definition is really good. So that leads me into a study that um, I am working on along with our associate dean for research here at the School of Nursing at WVU, um, Dr. P Piaman Jara Yaku. Um, she uh, obtained this grant through the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of Nursing Research, and it's coaching end-of-life palliative care for end-stage heart failure patients and their family caregivers in rural Appalachia. I'm the co-investigator on that study. So I want to talk briefly about this study. There's just all the grant information, and um, we do have a multidisciplinary research team, which includes um, our cardiologist here at the Heart and Vascular Institute, Dr. Um, Sokos. It also includes Dr. Um, Moss, who's from palliative uh, medicine. And uh, we also have Dr. Angel Smothers, who uh, is providing the intervention for this grant, um, a mental health uh, specialist, Dr. Uh, Smith, uh, Dr. Smothers and Dr. Smith are both here from the School of Nursing, and um, then we have our consultants uh, and our biostatistician. Anyway, this is our multidisciplinary team. We're all working together on this um, project. And a little bit of background information that we've heard time and time 
again in the echo um, heart failure <laughs> uh, presentations here about how many people are affected with heart failure, 6.5 million Americans in uh, uh, the United States. And um, so when patients and family members are not prepared for their worsening heart failure symptoms and they're not informed about end of life and palliative care measures, um, conservative comfort measures, a lot of times they can experience depression, fear, a painful death, home care burden and um, care burden uh, burnout, caregiver burnout, I should say, and medical expenses from anxiously seeking aggressive, but what turns out in the end to be futile care um, in some cases. So that is why we are um, doing this project. And a uh, little bit of background about West Virginia. We have one of the highest um, heart failure deaths in the United States, actually the highest uh, heart failure death in the United States at 32.6 per 100,000 population. 14% of those um, over 65 years of age in West Virginia have heart failure. And we have a large Appalachian region um, that stretches across West Virginia and there are 25.6 million people in this region and a large part of that is um, disadvantaged rural communities. So. Um, the National Institutes of Health designated the Appalachian region, region as a high priority for research um, because uh, our residents are really um, prone to extreme health and poverty inequities and limited access because of its rurality um, to health care. So, um, home end-of-life palliative care is really lacking as well across the Appalachian region. So these are the um, areas of significance that we address through this NIH grant award. And these are our aims. The intervention that we're testing is called FAMPAL care intervention and it's an intervention that works with both patients and families managing home um, supportive care at, um, for people with end-stage heart failure in rural West Virginia. And so we're doing this small, low-risk, randomized control trial. So we're going to implement, and we've already started um, implementation of this um, FAMPAL care uh, project, and um, we're going to implement it, uh, evaluate it success um, for possible subsequent clinical trials in a larger population and we're also evaluating student research engagement because we do um, want to have our students and and have started now that our fall semester is up and running to have them be involved in um, this research project. And so what we hope the impact of our R15 grant will be is that we hope that it results in new knowledge on coaching techniques for end-of-life palliative care with a culturally sensitive approach to end-of-life care in rural um, West Virginia. Um, and we would like the long-term impact to be a strengthening of the School of Nursing Research environment to engage our undergraduate and graduate students in clinical research, um, the collection of data on the implementation of research procedures for a larger clinical trial of this fam -pal care intervention. So this is just a um, graphic representation of our FAM PAL care coaching model to show how, you know, we have our coaching intervention components, um, what we hope our intermediate outcomes are, and then our long-term research endpoints are. And so, you know, really the whole idea is that we help our patients make the right decision, make sure that they have thought about their end of life, that they have their um, advanced directives in place, their medical power of attorney, and that they know what to expect so that we can make their quality of life um, the best that it possibly can be for patients um, with end-stage uh, heart failure.
And so what we're doing is we are recruiting um, uh, 36 patients and their family caregivers. Um, they also can be um, non-related caregivers as long as they're not paid caregivers. Um, so a lot of times, you know, in rural West Virginia, we have neighbors helping out neighbors. Um, and so they potentially could be enrolled um, if they agree to it. So um, we're going to have 36 dyads of these patients and family, uh, or I should just say caregivers, actually. And uh, so we'll have two groups um, randomly assigned. Um, and so the first group is the intervention group, and the second group is just your standard of care. And what we do um, in both of these groups is we have them fill out baseline um, data survey forms, which includes the Kansas City um, Cardiac uh, Questionnaire, uh, the KCCQ, uh, um, the um, ZERID-12, uh, survey, which is for uh, caregiver burden, and also the SF-12, which measures um, the depression and anxiety among our patients and um, also their functional status. And so we have them fill out, regardless of what group they're in, these uh, three surveys at baseline, and then we have them fill them out again at three months, and then finally at six months. And um, then the intervention, um, if they're in the intervention group, they get intervention um, over the span of a five-week period of time. And that intervention, like I mentioned earlier, is done by our um, palliative care faith-based nurse, Dr. Angel Smothers here in the School of Nursing. Um, she is ELNIC trained and has um, an extensive background in uh, hospice and palliative care nursing. And so she calls the patients in this intervention group on a weekly basis basis um, at their convenience and she has 30 to 45 minute conversations with them about symptom management at home, about any issues they're having with their care at home and she can help them out with uh, community-based referrals that they may or not be aware of um, to help them with home caregiving and um, then also helps them along along with um, palliative care issues and education and uh, filling out the um, medical power of attorney and advanced directives if they do not um, already have them. And if they do have them, she also, if they already do have them in place, which many of our patients do, thankfully, um, she likes to go over those with the patient and their caregivers just to make sure that they are up to date and accurate and they are uh, reflect what they presently want because sometimes people have had advanced directives on their file for a long period of time and now with uh, more education or with the progression of their disease they sometimes want to modify those so um, that's uh, what we do in our fam how care intervention. And this is just a um, little uh, copy of our recruitment flyer that I give out when I'm in charge of the uh, recruitment for the project. And so we're recruiting from um, inpatients here at our hospital and um, also from the outpatient clinics. And um, we're trying to do community-based uh, recruitment as well through the faith-based communities. So um, I, you know, we hand this uh, recruitment flyer out to explain a little bit about what the study is and who is eligible for that. And then we have our contact information there. And I believe that is it. So thank you so much. Um, are there any questions? Thank you so much, Trisha. That was excellent. And that case was so awesome, too. I felt like I was right there in the care. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Um, Shane, this usually never happens where 
just a one-on-one. -on -one, so <laughs> honestly, take advantage of it. Um, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, or you know anything you'd like to share um, with Trisha and myself, just feel free to unmute. This is a safe uh, space. I always tell everyone that. So. <laughs> Now you can hear me? Yes. There we go. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it was a great presentation. Yeah. It, uh, Thank you. Know, you. I, I came from Tennessee, so I, I get the Appalachian environment there. But, uh, you know, here in, in California, it's a little different. You know, we're kind of a HMO driven society out here. It's very heavy HMO. And a lot of our HMOs are very, um, they're actually pretty good with, uh, they have case managers on staff. And a lot of my patients, I get hospice and palliative care through the case managers through their HMO, they actually come to the hospital and talk to them from the insurance, you know, which is different. Wow, that's like, excellent. Yeah, yeah, we don't quite have that system here, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and that was really more, I think, insurance driven because it's a fine cost, uh, because they, really when they go to hospice, you know, hospice um, at home, they go on Medicare. So it takes the cost off the HMO. So it's, I guess, a, a benefit for the, for the HMO, but. Uh, sure. Um, but yeah, we here we only have uh, in my area we have four hospitals and we're about an hour from any academic center. So uh, you know, from north or south, UC San Diego is about an hour south, and UC Riverside an hour north. So uh, we don't have very many resources in this area, and there's four hospitals, but they've all popped up. I think about ten years ago, there's only one hospital here. And oh my! They're all community-based type hospitals, so we don't have a lot of the resources you know the the bigger cities have. But, so the HMOs have a lot, but. But that was a great presentation. Oh, well, thank you so much. And, you know, I, um, so yes, you do understand coming from Tennessee. Um, what part of Tennessee? Uh, Knoxville. Oh, that's where my sister, brother in law live Hello. in Knoxville. I, I wanted yeah. to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? I well, you can, you can go back if you're finishing up now, huh? <laughs> oh, my wife's from LA and it will never happen. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> It, Knoxville, I don't know, you know, if you go back often, but it's just growing by leaps and bounds. Every time I go and visit, it gets bigger, you know, it's just yeah. sprawling. But, um, at, yeah, so, you know, with this case study, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to shed any bad light on our clinicians. They are so totally dedicated. I just think it, you know, is miscommunication and this patient didn't seem to be really up on keeping his visits a lot of times. So, and we do also have wonderful case managers here in the hospital, but as you know, um, and we have hospitalists as well, um, but they don't always get called in depending on which service the patient happens to be on. And this patient was on a couple, you know, cause we've got, um, three or four different cardiology based type services. So getting bumped around to each one um, makes it a little difficult as well. But our case managers do uh, the best they can, but sometimes I, I feel that they, like this patient may have fallen through the cracks and could have possibly had a little bit better experience toward the end of his life um, than he did have. And so that's the whole hopes of our study. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, a lot of patients too have that stigma. They hear hospice and they automatically assume they're dying in a week. Right, right, exactly. For over two years. Oh, sure. Yeah, I've worked for hospice agencies here, and yeah, we've had long-term hospice patients that, and as you know, the trajectory of you know heart failure is like this, boom, like this, boom, you know, and so they can they because they do have those maybe not steady declines, but declines, they can justify keeping them on hospice because they are declining over time. So um, yeah, it might have been preferable for, for this gentleman. And hopefully we'll find out through this study that this coaching works. And I think as time goes on, as people become less and less um, afraid and more knowledgeable about hospice, that it's not just, you know, oh, you have six months, you know, of life left to live it's actually a way that you can live a much better quality of life for whatever time you have left <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. very interesting though yep yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I really appreciate both of your time. It's been a great session, honestly. <laughs> and, um, as I mentioned, we do post uh, our videos onto YouTube for later viewing as well. So um, Shane, I believe I added you to the email listserv, so you'll be getting all of the communication for the cardiac health sessions. Um, Included in the recap today, I'll, I'll put Trisha's uh, PowerPoint uh, didactic as well, so you can have access to that if you'd like. Um, just a few quick housekeeping announcements before we part ways. Um, our next session will be on September 18th, and Dr. Kakamo is providing the didactic on cardiac rehab. Um, another quick little announcement is that we're launching a new project uh, around memory health and Alzheimer's, and that actually launches on October 6th, and it's from 4 to 5 p.m. So if you all are interested in that, just shoot me an email. I'll make sure to send over the registration link for that. So thank you both so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.